questions that you must. So it's answer. happening. It's happening yeah, right now. It's happening right now. <laughs> right. Do you know what I'll probably do? I'll probably just have this be the introduction. So <laughs> just just going <laughs> know, straight everyone. into it. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I should probably introduce you. Say who you are, because people listening to this for the first time will just be like, "Oh, hang on a minute. Who is this guy talking?" <laughs> I. Do you know what? Actually just to kind of cut into your introduction a little bit i think more people will recognize your voice than will recognize mine but alex i open the floor to you who are you why are you here i mean that's very nice of you i uh, i don't know if that's true but that's very nice of you to say uh i'm alex um i'm the co-host of batman the animated series podcast which i host with my brother who is a dc comics and marvel comics writer and artist amongst other uh comic book properties and we love batman the animated series hence why we do a review show on it so we watch episodes and we talk about those episodes we've had some great guests on so far from writers to directors to voice actors from the show and yeah just talk about all things batman the animated series got a lot of cool episodes to review coming up that we're looking forward to diving into as well as some fun themed episodes like the toys you know mm. and stuff like that uh we originally did spider-man the animated series podcast for many years and kind of delved and did most of that show and that was always i i love that show and i watched it a lot as a kid so i don't discount it but that podcast was always a sort of if i can get this right then i can go on to batman that was yeah. always the, the the gateway because i am a stupid fan of batman the animated series um i love it very much i have a ridiculous knowledge of the show um which i think is evident sometimes oh i'm dropping things which i think is evident sometimes in the videos that i post on social media mm -hmm. i do a lot of fun podcast clips taken from a podcast and i dub over the animated series and kind of make it look like those characters are saying what we're saying and it's it's so funny because I know exactly where to go to those scenes because in my mind I'm like ah episode ten you know and mm -hmm. twenty one minutes in right at the end that would be perfect for this so it's yeah. it's silly but I love it so that's yeah. why I do a podcast. Well, what you said there rings very true with me as well because when I make my videos, I kind of piece the jigsaw together in my head, you know, the actual visual editing of it while I'm writing it and go oh yeah. I'll take that clip from Feet of Clay and then I'll take that little bit from uh, Almost Got Him and they'll, they'll yeah. transition together nicely. And nine times out of ten, it all lines up perfectly. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of Alfred in the Batcave talking to Batman in our clips that we do. We love to do Alfred yeah. and Batman type of scenarios. Um, and there are go-to episodes. You were just talking about like, oh, yeah, I'll go to Feet of Clay for this and everything. Uh, and I'm starting to realize that like, oh, I am going to like the same old <laughs> episode. So I've been trying to like not do that and like look for other ones. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, there's a perfect like this. There's a great Batcave scene in like Two-Face Part 2 with Alfred and Batman that I love to use a lot. So, yeah, again, I'm just like, you know, I love this show and I know it. I know it too well and my brother sometimes is like look i know we like this but like chill out you friggin nerd <laughs> yeah, you need other hobbies <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah i feel the same way frankly um yeah I've, there have been times where i've been sitting here you know writing something that i think is like a really deep cut reference thinking oh my god is anyone actually going to be interested in this has anyone else even thought about this before has anyone noticed it or is it just me being obsessive and weird um, fortunately, I, I think I found a, a modest audience. So, yeah, I think that I mean, even though it's it's obviously niche what we talk about when we talk about a specific show from 1992, but <laughs> um, there, I mean, it had a huge, it still has a huge audience. And what I love is when listeners write in and they'll say something like, "I haven't watched this show since I was a kid." but I've started watching it again now because I've been listening to your podcast and I'm watching along with you guys. That's oh, really cool for a start. Hmm. There's other people that have never seen the show, but have started watching it because they've been listening to our podcast. That's also wild to me. Cause I'm like, well, how old are you? And they're like, Oh, I'm like 31. And I'm like, how have you never seen this? But great. <laughs> and there's other ones. It's like, I love this show. And now I'm watching it with my kids, you know? And hmm. it's like, my kids are now into the DCAU and, watching batman and then onto superman and etc so yeah it's I, I i think it's really cool that it still lives on that way yeah yeah completely agree um the thing i find really weird is recently i've been getting like comments from people saying stuff like um 
I never watched this show. I'm not a fan of the characters, but I like listening to your videos. And I'm like, yeah, okay. that tells, that's baffling. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah I've had a few of those. I'm like, to because we when we review episodes, we don't go act one. This is what happens. Mm. Act, you know, we we hop around a lot and yeah. we talk about specifically the things that we notice that are either funny or unique to us. We, but like, if you'd never seen the episode and you were listening to our episode review, I, I'd be amazed if you knew what was going on. I'd be yeah. lost. So yeah, that, that blows my mind when people tell me that type of stuff as well. It's crazy. Yeah. It's the power of the algorithms, I suppose. Just stuff being yeah. suggested to people. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So now we know who you are. Let's talk about our topic of the day. And we're going to talk about the genius that was Shirley Walker. Yes. Yeah, so ahead of this episode, I put together a list of facts. Let me bring them up. And I thought I would share them with you. So I have 10 Shirley Walker facts. <clears throat> cool. Hit me. So number one, Walker had a distinguished career as a piano soloist with the San Francisco Symphony, beginning while she was still in high school. So music just ran through her from, from an early age. Amazing. Yep. Love that. Her first movie credit was as a synthesis on Apocalypse Now, which is an amazing mm. movie. Uh, I, I really need to know the story of how she got connected with uh, Francis Ford Coppola there for that film. Because Did, So who was the composer of that movie? Does it say? Mm, 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 mm. I'm going to look it up. Uh, Apocalypse Now composer. Or composter, that's not the same thing. Um <laughs> What is the classic? That's Ride of the Valkyrie by Wagner. Music was composed by Carmine Coppola, so Francis Coppola's brother. Oh, right. Okay. Interesting. Is, is Carmine Coppola Nicolas Cage's dad? I don't know. Oh, I'm, you, you know, you're going deeper than I know. I mean, I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm pretty good with knowing composers. Um, one of the reasons that I said Shirley Walker would be great to talk about today is because obviously I love the music of Batman the Animated Series and she is the pioneer of that. But I mm. also just, I listen to movie scores quite a lot. Mm. Like I'll listen to Batman the Animated Series music just if I'm like doing the dishes, you know what yeah. I mean? Or like I'll listen to the music of, I don't know, Thomas Newman or John Williams or Danny Elfman or Bernard Herrmann, you know, that type of stuff. And I love that the influence for well, someone like Danny Elfman is Bernard Herrmann, you know, a lot of Alfred Hitchcock and recently found out that I've always kind of known this, but to hear it from the horse's mouth from um, Alan Burnett talking about how Hitchcock was one of the biggest influences in his life. And when it came to composing stories for Batman, the animated series, not music, but, you know, creating mm. stories, it was always Hitchcock in his mind, first and foremost, like when he wrote Two Face Part One and Two, stuff like mm. that. And then obviously the the music kind of pairs with that. And it's very Danny Elfman took influence from Bernard Herrmann, who did all the Hitchcock stuff. And obviously Shirley Walker was on the same orchestra and was uh Danny Elfman's composer um for a while on certain projects yeah. and she worked very closely with him on batman and batman returns which is why she was chosen for batman the animated series um so that's really cool knowing that like you know even in high school she was doing all of that and then she was part of the uh, orchestra in apocalypse now that's awesome yeah yeah it's amazing uh right what did i get up to so i got up to apocalypse now fact didn't i okay so number three a pioneer for women film composers, she stood at the podium at a time when no women were doing so in the industry. And as a little aside, I was reading a interview with her where she talked about when she stood up at the podium for the first time, a whole bunch of other composers had turned up and were just like looking in through the window because it was such like a historic moment. <laughs> they wanted to say that they were there taking part. I'd find That's that great. really disconcerting, you know, if I'm trying to do my job and there's a bunch of i was gonna say weirdos then but <laughs> a bunch of people Fans. Like, yeah peering over the fence stop looking at me uh let's see so next we have walker was hired to write for memoirs of an invisible man in 1992 her credit was groundbreaking in that it was the first time a major hollywood studio hired a woman as the sole composer wow 
Uh, Shirley opened the door for many young composers, kickstarting their career by inviting them to compose music for BTAS under her supervision. Most notably, Christopher Carter, Michael McQuistian and Lolita Ritmanis, who would go on to work on pretty much every major superhero property since then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, Ritmanis as well. That music is just great. What has been added to Batman over... I, I, I can't remember um again i'm not going to try and put you on the spot but there was mm. recently one that i found out was composed by romanis that i like looked up and it was like one of the iconic like villain scores and i was like i had no idea that was done i thought it was done by shelly walker but no it's 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 by romanis it's amazing is it the poison ivy theme that's exactly what it was well done yeah, yeah. yeah that's what it was <laughs> i was like i always thought that was shelly walker but nope no it's really good it's really yeah. good yeah yeah and it's funny actually um obviously the, these three composers have all like paired up and stayed working together for 30 years they've got a company called dynamic music partners and they've done everything you know teen titans justice league um what was that other show young justice is that what it's called i can't Probably. remember now. what like outside of the dcau you mean yeah outside of the dcau yeah, yeah. uh they've done a bunch of marvel stuff as well but um I think it was around the time of Batman Beyond is when they kind of were allowed to like spread their wings and take over the majority of the composing with Shirley Walker just supervising them. Well, and, and she cool. short she shortly passed away, didn't she? Um, yeah. Was it? I think it was it was early two thousands. I think it was like two thousand four. I'm not sure. Yeah, something. But, like um, that. Yeah, so it might have been she stepped back because she was ill and those other ones. And I'm speculating here, but still, yeah, I mean. You know, they she took them and and basically showed them the sound of the DCAU, and then they they took the reins and and kept on going, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a fact here that has a quote from Shirley in it. So Shirley found the task of scoring Feet of Clay Part Two very challenging, saying it was demanding story wise. There was so much going on. I was so proud of it that I submitted it for Emmy consideration, and that's the one I got a nomination for it's so funny you say that like because literally this morning my brother and i've recorded uh feet of clay part one review for our mm. podcast and i've read that fact out on the show and it is one of the greatest scores of the entire series absolutely um we've always my brother and i have always loved the fact that when composers create music john williams is known for this where you put the title of the hero in the music you know, where it's just like Star Wars, it's a Star Wars, mm -hmm. it's a, and all of that. And you can kind of like go along and like Indiana Jones or whatever. And Clayface is one of those because we always sing, I'm Clayface, <laughs> I'm Clayface, I'm Clayface, I'm Clayface. We always do that. Um, and I think it makes it that more memorable for us as well. But we, we didn't really do that with a lot of other ones. And it's just because that, that particular set up a music that com that composition is just it's very memorable and yeah and i love the menacing side to it as well when like yeah. something bad's happening it's almost like a dun 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 type of music as mm -hmm. well yeah um, a lot of bongos in there as well which is unusual for for BTS. yeah 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 definitely so yeah i think um it's definitely worthy of of the uh the emmy nod for sure yeah absolutely um Okay, so next fact. So Shirley actually viewed her work on Mask of the Phantasm as the best of her entire career. And I'm not going to argue with her. It's it's absolutely wonderful. It is amazing, yeah. Um, I I mean, we've all got personal opinion. I, I've, definitely, I've definitely listened to more of um, uh, other com composed pieces of music by her more than Mask of the Phantasm over the years. Um, but Phantasm is like where she fully got to realize her Batman theme because mm -hmm. even though it started with Elfman, you know, and it was a it was an ode to it, it's very different because yeah. you know you've got you've got it in the the intro of every Batman episode is the Danny Elfman score, and in the early episodes it, there was a few like little uh, cues of it that would come in, but his Batman theme is is different than Shelley made ultimately. Yeah. And that's really realized in Mask of the Phantasm. Um, I don't know if you have this fact or not. I, I'm sorry if I'm stepping on one of your facts, but the uh, the chorus, the choir, uh, you're smiling. Am I about to? You to might give it be, away? but it's the next fact. So go ahead. 
Okay, the choir, I believe, now you've got the fact in front of me, so you can correct me, is saying the names of all of the people that made it, all of the head producers and writers and stuff, but saying it backwards, is that right? Yeah, so there's a little bit more to it. So she was a, this is the fact number nine. So Shirley is a big advocate for people being credited properly. And there's a big problem in the music industry with, you know, like the composer will get all the credit when maybe they only did a fraction of the work. Uh, which is a big complaint right. she had about a lot of stuff. And apparently she had some sort of argument with Danny Elfman about it. But anyway, when she learned Ooh. when she learned that some of the performers wouldn't get credit for their work on the Mask of the Phantasm score, she had the chant, um, excuse me, she had the choir chant their names backwards during the opening credits. So essentially she was cheating the system going, all right, you, you won't put them in the written credits while they're in the song right in the credits at the beginning yes, yeah that's yeah. that's great yeah because you've got that 3d pan through of gotham city that they yeah. they did in that movie um yeah i mean uh, if she believes it's her best obviously that's that's amazing and she clearly she knows her stuff so if that's her like uh, her her top choice for the dcau then as you said i'm not going to argue there um but yeah when i found out that fact because i always wondered when i watched that i was like why is there a choir singing and just like singing nonsense? And that, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I don't think it has to make sense. I'm glad that it does. It's just damn cool. That's why she did it. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good reason. Uh, okay. So the final fact I, I bring to the table today was that she won a daytime Emmy for music direction and composition in 1996 for her work on Batman, the animated series. I believe it was, for robin's reckoning i might be mixing that up with something else though um but she would also be nominated for superman in 1998 and mm. win another daytime emmy in 2001 for batman beyond yeah um i believe robin's reckoning the emmy was for the writer who ah, okay is uh randy rogel mm -hmm. um who's a, a really great guy and uh, we've had on our show and he's full of amazing uh, information he if uh, anyone wants to listen to that episode mm -hmm. of our show um there's parts where he explains what sub-zero was originally going to be mm -hmm. including that obviously uh mr freeze was not the choice of the villain it was going to be bane and there was going to be a whole sort of play on the nightfall comic that they were going to do um, but then that all got scrapped because Arnold Schwarzenegger was cast as Mr. Freeze and they're like, yeah, just do Mr. Freeze. And he told us the uh, very funny scenario where, where they were saying, can't you just go on your like word processor and just replace Bane with Mr. Freeze and keep the same script? He's like, no, they're two totally different villains. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he won the Emmy for that. Uh, mm. But uh, the music of Robin's Reckoning is very good. I'm not sure if that was... Shirley Walker, it probably was because she really did kind of helm the really big episodes. Um, and then her Superman theme is so underrated. It's so yeah. damn good. Like we all love John Williams score. We all love it. And it, it's the like, it's almost like the, what is a superhero score that you would play Superman, right? Like I think mm -hmm. even over Batman, Superman is just like, I am a hero. Like here's my score. It's very triumphant. But she... She made a score for Superman that I feel like if Danny Elfman were to ever do a Superman score for a movie, especially like back in the 90s, which he almost did with Tim Burton, um, it would have sounded very similar to that. And mm. I think Shirley's uh, Shirley's score is just incredible for that show. It really kicks it off as like, this isn't the Superman that you know. This is our version of Superman, you know, and... The fact that Batman started because it was an ode to Superman's Fleischer cartoons from when they were a kid, and then it kind of came full circle with them doing their own Superman show, I think is great. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's poetic, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is, um, yeah. I remember Bridget watching... Lucas, it all comes in around in a circle and repeats itself <laughs> and all that crap. I, I remember watching, I think it was on the, the Superman, the animated series Blu-ray, there's a making of documentary, and they talk about the music i think it's from there i could be mistaken i'm sure people will correct me if i'm wrong um where they were talking about how they really when they, when they were asking shirley to write the theme they said look we don't want john williams we don't want superman we don't want to be able to say superman to the music we want something unique and 
um, completely different. So she went away. She worked on something unique and completely different, and she hated it. She right. played it. She played it to them. They didn't like it either. So she just went off and did her Superman, Superman, da 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 da, da Superman. Man, yep, it, yep it works. And played it to them. They were like, "Wow, this is exactly what we were looking for." <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like I'm Clayface, I'm Clayface. You know, it's that's just it's just you have to do that, especially for Superman. You need a triumphant theme, and to have yeah. the the beats of his name in there just makes so much sense. Yeah, and I'm just thinking now, in the Superman music, obviously every episode had its own soundtrack, much like Batman. Um, I can't really think of many villain themes from Superman. Obviously, Lex Luthor had quite a good theme, and like Metallo had quite a frantic one. I couldn't like hum it for you right now. No, I I know I know the Metallo. It's funny you say that. But I don't even know Lex Luthor's. I couldn't I couldn't sing that one. The Metallo one, I know the vibe. I know exactly what you mean by that. Mm. Um, and he's one of my favorite villains of that of that animated series. It's just so well done. Um, what a cool villain. He's basically like, because uh, I love Robocop and Terminator. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, this is evil Robocop and Terminator for Superman. I love that. Yeah. You know what I think the funniest thing about that is the casting of Malcolm McDowell. Because, so the whole thing with Metallo is he's quite happy being a robot man until he realizes that he can't have sex anymore basically and he feels no pleasure <laughs> from molesting lois lane yeah and i don't know if you're familiar with the career of malcolm mcdowell but he always plays like perverts like even in like in a clockwork orange he, there's obviously yep. a, a of an assault scene um he was caligula um even in i think in star trek generations i think i swear there's like a full nude scene with him like standing in the nip in the woods for some reason i have to wonder if it's written into his contract that you know he's like i have to be able to he expose to myself pervy. yeah <laughs> i mean after clockwork he became you know very well known so maybe he's like that's my way in to, to yeah. all these big roles yeah that's true i mean he also it was was it an apple he couldn't taste or maybe i'm thinking of like pirates of the caribbean or something now i think about it but it was food he couldn't taste as well and yeah. all these other things yeah but the thing that set him off was like he kissed lois lane he's like why can't i feel anything yes that was the thing that he was like ah uh, uh, that's too far that's too many things yeah that's yeah. true um yeah I, I don't you're right i don't know many themes that i sing from superman as much as i can sing from batman but again mm. i the moment that these mu these pieces of music came on to spotify basically is when i i had direct access to them all the time i mean obviously i knew the songs because i watched the show so much as a kid from watching it on tv then having vhs vhs tapes and then buying them on dvd i bought the show like six times over my my life so far <laughs> I, yeah i find and then i got you know blu-ray and all of that and i finally have it on uh, on apple um just so i on digital so i can watch them anywhere plus if you uh, kids if you buy stuff on apple every time it goes to 4k they upgrade it for free unlike amazon who's like oh you bought the hd version if you want the 4k you're gonna have to pay full price for that as well which sucks so apple that's the one thing that's what made me choose apple over amazon for um having all the digital and like master the phantasm that's coming out in 4k in a couple weeks and i'm or i've already got it basically it's going to be upgraded for free which is great Damn, because I have them on Amazon. Oh, what Bummer, a mistake. Man. What a mistake. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like there's some things that I shame I don't have for Amazon or I, I don't buy them on Amazon. I've bitten the bullet and recently I have not seen the Justice League or Justice League Unlimited until very recently okay. because I, how can I put this delicately? I don't like Batman being part of a team. Mm. Um and all of those other heroes i just don't really care about like i like superman because superman the animated series and it's about superman mm -hmm. i'm sure if they did uh wonder woman the animated series or a green lantern the animated series i could have like been on more on board and followed mm -hmm. them it's kind of like what marvel did make a solo hero and then eventually bring them together um and i look i, I enjoyed the justice league shows i think they were good there's lots that I didn't know happened that continued storylines from other shows past that I really liked and characters that I thought, well, that's the last time we see 
Toy Man, and I was I was wrong. I was like, oh shit, Toy Man's in this episode, or Clayface is is, is in this episode. Really mm. cool. Some great Joker stuff in there as well. Every now and then, but yeah, all of that. Like what I felt the biggest thing that was missing from Justice League was the music. Mm-hmm. Um, there was nothing memorable. Like the theme tunes to them, both Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. I knew them. Especially the bow, 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 like <laughs> that's fun, but there's just no, there's no like Shirley Walker isms in it. And I know she had passed by then, but still, there's loads of composers that we obviously work with her that were working on these shows still, as you said. Yeah, and it just, it just made me like that was the biggest piece was the music that was missing that made me feel like it's not the same as like watching Batman or Superman. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I think part of that might be down to the fact that they had moved over to synth music by that point so it was all electronic no orchestra basically um, yeah especially and I think you're in, right. especially in justice league season one like it's really obvious like early mm. 2000s electronic music and i bought the soundtrack and i was listening to it going oh I, I don't think i like this actually no and i you think like that just that's that's true for movie scores in general like i uh... There's been a few exceptions here with what I'm about to say, but for the most part, I don't think there's been a hummable score for a superhero in a very, very, very long time. I mean, I'm I'm talking like the last time I could hum a score to a superhero movie was probably the Avengers theme, um, which was then obviously used in all the other ones, but the first time was was in 2008 Avengers. Mm-hmm. The ba 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 ba, you right. know that one. Um, and that's Alan Silvestri, who's just a legend. He's awesome, but they're just—it's all been like vibe mm-hmm. more than an actual like. Let's create a hummable score, and I think music is so important because when you leave the cinema or your living room or wherever you're watching this stuff you know you can remember bits of it but music is a great sort of doorway into those memories or like mm-hmm. makes you feel closer to it you know when i was a kid i like watching indiana jones and then when he was doing something cool and the indie theme started playing or the james bond theme started playing when james bond was doing something cool instantly you're more connected to that scene where you're just like oh my god this is the coolest thing i've ever seen this guy's amazing like i want to be this dude and you know and go on adventures or whatever same with batman Mm -hmm. um but yeah justice league uh the reason i brought that up is because uh, it's so expensive on apple and so i had to bite the bullet and buy it on amazon because it was way way cheaper but uh still when i watched it i felt like yeah it was just missing so much of that like that world vibe that even though I'm saying it's mostly vibe now, there was no, there was no connective tissue of like, there's the beats that I know for Batman or for Superman. Like I didn't hear Superman's theme once. I didn't hear Batman's theme really once. I heard like a teaser of it every now Mm. and then because they know it's obviously, you know, a very popular piece of music, but yeah, there just wasn't any like definitive themes for characters that I could hum and remember. Hmm. Yeah, and I I wonder if that is not just a question of you know the the instruments or lack of, uh, but also perhaps down to budgetary restrictions because I know when Batman was made, um, Steven Spielberg had just signed a deal with Warner Brothers a couple of years prior, and one of the key parts of his contract was that Warner Brothers would reignite their animation department and give them the same resources that they had in the 40s and the 50s. So when they made Tiny Toons, they had this whole orchestra. And when they finished Tiny Toons, they were sitting around doing nothing. And Gene McCurdy went, oh, we could use them for Batman. And that kept people in their jobs. And I was listening to one of the tracks from the Superman soundtrack today, where they play the Superman um, the new Superman Batman Adventures theme and it continues for a little bit and you can hear Shirley Walker talking in the background and she's she's got Bruce Tim with her and she says by the way everyone this is Bruce Tim he's the guy that insisted we have original music for every single episode he kept you all in a job and they all <laughs> applaud him let's see if I can find that clip actually and maybe I'll edit it in if I don't get a copyright strike <laughs> yeah no I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear that as well off pod because um well, so 
that's so funny you say that because again you're like okay there's the batman music there's the superman music those are the ones or at least the superman theme and some of them i remember but i always forget that they did a like batman and superman combo theme mm -hmm. and i can't remember me for the life of how it goes goes yeah i remember now thank yeah. you very much there it is yeah i know that... why I, I know exactly why you can't remember it it's because on all of the re-releases they cut out that title sequence for the batman episodes and they just put the original animated series intro on yeah you're right it's weird. Um, i noticed that it is weird because when they did the adventures of batman and robin which was basically like season three of the show they have a different intro for yeah. and um they have a different theme tune for yeah. the batman and robin as well that's one i forgot until like watching them you know however many years ago i was like oh yeah there's this but yeah you're right they don't have the batman and superman combo theme tune and that's a shame because that's also a very good score yeah. it sounds more superman than batman but it works it's a really good score yeah yeah yeah, and it's. I think it's one of the the big those DVD re releases were a big contributing factor for why people think Batman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures are the same show. They are not. They are different yeah. shows. New Batman Adventures is a continuation, but it's got a completely well, not completely. It's a mostly different creative team. Like mm. a lot of the writers weren't the same. I mean, you still yeah. had obviously Bruce Tim and Alan Burnett and Paul Dini, but uh, Eric Radomski was gone. Um, Ted Blackman, who designed Gotham City and Batman the Animated Series, he was gone, which is, you know, no disrespect to the people that worked on the new Batman adventures, but their Gotham was not a character in the same way that Gotham was in Batman the Animated Series. The buildings were just like these black monoliths, you know, they were just, yeah. they were just there. Beautiful, um, yeah. Kevin Altieri, who, he moved on. He didn't direct any episodes and some of his episodes of BTAS are just some of the most visually striking ones, thanks to him and his team of storyboard artists. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the the end of Feet of Clay Part 2, for instance, that's just spectacular. Mm. Um, Two-Face Part 1. Ugh, I'm, I'm just going to list episodes randomly now. But... <laughs> no, no, I, this is <laughs> what I point. do. Most of the time. I do get your point. I know exactly what you mean. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to chat with some of these guys. We had Kevin Altieri on a little while ago. And... Uh, I loved finding out how the rain in Two Faced Part Two mm. came about because he. Uh, I've always noticed that rain. I've always thought, oh my god, that that, that rain is so realistic and heavy and like, what is that? And he's like, what's real rain? And because he never knew that either. The animation team, I can't remember what uh, animation team it was exactly that did it in Korea. Yes. I think it was Dong Yang. You think you're right, yeah. And it was uh, just, it was monsoon season. And they, were, they just stuck a camera in a window facing a street light where the rain was coming down from the street light. So they captured all of that rain in the street light. And then they took it and they obviously played with it and such. And then that was the rain that they gave them. And like everybody, uh, Kevin said, was just like shocked, like how good this rain looked to the point where later on when other writers were coming around like marty eisenberg and stuff and they're like oh we've got this great scene you know and there's this rain and stuff and they would get it back you know like a test run of like the footage and they're like this rain sucks where's two face part two rain <laughs> like that's what i want give me two face yeah. part two rain yeah so yeah it's it's amazing how much attention to detail the animation studios, um, well, besides Acom, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the Acom gets a bad rap on a side note. But um, yeah, just it was just a perfect blend of like directors, storyboard artists, mm -hmm. writers, and then the animation studios. They just kind of all, they all got it. And um, the one thing that I will say about Kevin Altieri that I find uh, extra fascinating and appreciate is his storyboards. I've seen quite a few storyboards from our guests because they all they all keep them his are so incredibly detailed mm. that there is no surprise to me that all of his episodes when they went to the animation studios overseas they came back almost perfect because he left no room for error he was like this is exactly what i want and here's the detail that i want you to apply and that's how much he wanted his episodes to stand out and they do they really do he's mm. directed some of the best of that show yeah yeah, absolutely. I think he was fortunate in that none of his scripts 
went to Acom. I don't think. No, I think he's maybe. I think he said he worked. There was one, I believe. Yeah, and then uh, you know, alternatively, I had Frank Parr on. Who yeah, had, poor Frank Parr. <laughs> he had so many. He had been mostly Acom episodes, and he was talking about the headache that he had to deal with. But you know, even knowing this, when we've been watching these, you know, episodes like the Underdwellers, mm-hmm. um, which is Acom and gets a really bad rap. Um, or we just uh, reviewed Prophecy of Doom, which is Acom. Uh, we thought Prophecy of Doom looked actually pretty damn good. Like I was, uh, it didn't need the big old fight at the end of the planetarium. That was kind of like way over the top. But as an episode, that's quite a fun, unique little episode, um, and very sort of early Batman storytelling with like a cult and like this guy trying to trick the rich and stuff. Mm. And the animation on that and the music in that uh, that like really is dialed up to a pretty great level so yeah i think um i think acom gets a bit of a bad rap sometimes i really do yeah i i feel like maybe you need to be an animation professional to really appreciate how <laughs> how bad they are you know to, yeah, to, to suppose, the average yeah. viewer you'll watch them and go yeah that's fine but you know it might not match what they had in their minds uh, particularly yeah. when you compare it to stuff that tms and spectrum had done yeah, that's true. And like um, that also just made me realize there is one uh, detail like we reviewed Feet of Clay Part 1 today, my brother and I, which will be an episode coming soon. And uh, Acom did that episode. Yeah. And what was said by Bruce Tim is that it was the episode that they sent back for them to completely redo yeah. more than more than three times or three times or more. Like, that's crazy. Like, it, it, and just so they stopped cringing. You know, and like, okay, this is this is decent enough for us to air. They weren't even like perfect. They were just like, okay, we can air this, but we've asked you to do this like three times by now. So who knows what that first run looked like? You know? Yeah, I wonder if anyone's got a copy of it anywhere. I don't, like Dan Reber keeps so much stuff on VHS. I'm going to ask him. Like, yeah, yeah, he t- I out, know. Pick through your VHSs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dan is Dan is great. Like he he just like, he's so open to chatting with with anyone about batman and that i think that's so great because he could easily be like ah you know i'll just leave me alone and stuff yeah. but he's just he's such a good dude dan yeah uh he probably will have answers for you on that as well he's <laughs> he's got he he he's become like a little guru to a lot of podcasters that are mm-hmm. involved in the dcau in knowledge that we can't find on the internet yes that's right he's got an encyclopedic knowledge of practically everything to the point that like before i started doing like video essays i just like upload like wobbly shorts of stuff in my batman collection and uh, i did a video about some of the original art that i would bought and this is how i got connected to him he just randomly commented on it going this is a lovely video i'm going to correct you on a couple of things though <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um yeah during our interview he did the same thing where i was like bringing facts and he's like that's really nice but that's not true and you're like oh okay and that's a really nice way of saying it you know instead of being like wrong let me tell you what happened yeah yeah Yeah, he's a nice guy i really appreciate him as a resource as well he's so generous with his knowledge because the thing i find really annoying about a lot of like online fan communities is gatekeeping Mm -hmm. um people like i want to get all this knowledge and keep it to myself which is why when um the storyboard artist brad raider he shared like all of his batman storyboards with me and i've been making them into little animatics and uploading them to youtube not because you know they get millions of views and everybody loves them but because i like them i think it's important because you know in 10 years time who's going to give a shit what i think about say bane but there will be animation fans who'd be like oh watching batman the animated series going oh i wonder how they did that how did they do this and then They'll use whatever is prominent in the future. Google, let's say, still Batman yeah. storyboards. And then that video is going to be there for, in theory, the rest of time to inform ne- the next generation of artists who otherwise wouldn't have been able to see this stuff. That's very true. No, that's a really good point. And like that r- reminds me of why I do this, right? Like, um, you know, the uh, just like anything passion related, passion is the number one and then monetization yeah. is number two. Um I've been fortunate to be able to monetize some of my stuff, not to not to even an amount that can afford to pay for the monthly costs that, you know, I endure each month to run the podcast and such. But still, it's been super helpful and generous. And those that 
you know have even our listeners have like we have a tip jar and they leave us you know some some monies every now and then which is super amazing and like can't even believe that but i i do this for free you know what i mean like yeah. i spend a lot of my free time doing this because i love it and mm-hmm. i feel like this is stuff i want to share with everyone because i find it super interesting and if i find batman super interesting i'm not the only one in the world you know that finds batman the animated series super interesting i know that and i love sharing that and um and getting that feedback sometimes from from people in comments but the gatekeeping i've also experienced Mm -hmm. um the thing about that is it it it's taken me a while to not engage with it so to the set to the to my point here is that with our podcast my brother and i there are lots of things in batman that we will make fun of right mm-hmm. we will see something and i have nothing against review shows that go right we're going to review on leather wings so at the beginning there is a shadow on a building and then there is a guy, a security guard, and they literally tell you beat for beat the episode, you know, yeah. and they're like, and they're like, wasn't this great? And it's all like, it's, it's a review. Sure. But I'm getting, I don't feel like I'm getting much substance out of that. And mm. you know, that's just because that type of review isn't for me. I don't listen to or watch those types of reviews because I've seen the episode. I know what happens. I want mm. to, I want to be entertained basically. Um, And that's, you know, my brother and I, we've always had these conversations, you know, uh, in the comfort of our own homes or at a pub or like whatever, and had a laugh over them. And the whole reason I started doing a podcast with him is because I was like, I enjoy these chats and I'd love to share these chats with the world. So he agreed to do a podcast and off we went. And because we make fun of things in Batman, because that's what's funny to us and entertaining, I've had a lot of people not a lot but a fair amount of people either message or comment just like you know what how but essentially questioning my fandom right like mm-hmm. why would you do this that's not funny or who are you trying to pretend to be or just attacking in any way possible and i'm i'm mm. just thinking i'm i'm not tainting batman here i'm not like you know my my podcast isn't listened to by billions or millions of people or even hundreds of thousands of people you know it's not going to change their opinions and be like oh yeah you know what batman the animated series is stupid and let's laugh at it like we love it to death and i like that's not why i do the show it's just that that's where our conversations lead it's fun so when someone tries to to gatekeep that and tell me like what my podcast should be or my fandom should be i don't understand it i'm just like just then, you know, my show's not for you. That's fine. There's plenty of other shows I'm sure yeah. that you love that are about Batman that aren't like my show. And, you know, that's why they exist as well. Yeah. No, I completely agree with you. I do find reviews where they just recount the events of the episode. Just, just uh, maybe I'm being a bit harsh here, but I, I find it a bit pointless because it's like, well, if I wanted to know what happened, I just watch it, you know? Mm. Um yeah and uh, again there's i don't think that's being harsh it's just a matter of taste you know it's just like that's not what i'm looking for when i want to relive some nostalgia right because i've seen the show maybe if you haven't seen the show but then why wouldn't you just watch the show instead of listen to review but anyway my point is is that like you know that's that's for some people and it's just not 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 my taste and i get my show isn't going to be for everyone Mm -hmm. i've had i've had one review that was two stars and it's like great show full of great facts hate the guy's voice two stars and i'm like what <laughs> like <laughs> maybe like three four stars like come on man um but it's just yeah it's just one of those things you open yourself up to obviously scrutiny and stuff when you do these things as well um and that's the you know especially as you grow in popularity more and more of this stuff mm-hmm. comes out the woodwork Um, and because I haven't experienced this level of uh, attention, I guess, um, I would engage, like if someone, uh, would accuse me of not knowing something or misunderstood the joke or something like that, I'm like on the comments, like, 
I'm being nice. I'm not like, listen here, yeah. dickhead, you know, but I'm <laughs> like, hey, um, this is, you know, we were saying this because we were joking about this and stuff like that. So if it upset you, but you're just not going to change their minds and they just come back with something even worse. Mm -hmm. And my brother, because he deals with, you know, because he's a comic book artist and he's a writer, he's dealt with a lot of this and he's just like, don't engage, just don't engage. Because the, the thing is, is that the more people comment, the more engagement you're getting anyway, and it's helping mm. your videos or whatever uh, go more viral. But just don't engage because they're just not going to they're not going to change their minds. They're literally trying to provoke you and mm. you're giving in. Um, I'm going off topic from completely talking about Shelley yeah, Walker here. Well, you've, you just reminded me of a similar experience I had with uh, with my lockup video. Uh, I don't know if you've watched it, but basically I argue that he's kind of like a fascist far right version of batman yeah and i agree with that you'd be surprised at the number of people that disagree but do you know what is really interesting is that video attracted disinformation bots interesting and i could tell that they were disinformation bots partly because it's my like day job looking for these kind of patterns and finding these bad actors and getting rid of them Oops, just punch my mic stand <laughs> but they they have Usernames that contain a full name, usually a feminine name. So it would be like Mary Mears and then a string of random numbers and letters. They'll have no profile picture, a recently crea uh, created account, no uploads, no playlists, nothing like that. And they immediately come in with hostile comments trying to incite an argument. So, for instance, I had this one come in saying that, you know, um, Lockup is clearly not a fascist because fascists are socialists. Um, and it, it, it was something along the lines of, you know, it's uh, you are you have demonstrated that you are politically illiterate and do not understand. You should give up on YouTube right now. <laughs> like, All right. OK. And at first, I thought it was someone having like a genuine conversation. Uh, and I responded with something along the lines of you know well look, we're going to agree to disagree i live in europe i know what fascism is mm. uh, okay mussolini was part of the socialist party initially but he left to form his own party and denounced socialism as a con um and this whole conversation went on and it, it dawned on me that this was a disinformation bot because they were responding but without the context of what I had said. Now, it could be that it was just a really thick person that can't read. But <laughs> sure. it, was, it was so bad. That I was like, wait yeah. a minute. This isn't actually a person. Because the, the responses just did not make any sense at all. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've encountered something like that. I should keep an eye out for that just in case. Mm. I mean, I'm not engaging anyway, but I should keep an eye out for something that provoking. Um but yeah, they just, uh, whether it's a bot or whether it's a person, you're not, they're literally, they are programmed, so to speak, to want to provoke you and they're not going to change their mind and you're not going to change their mind yeah. either. Um, and so I found it a big waste of time. But what I've also noticed is as my podcast has, has grown in popularity is that other listeners start to engage with those people <laughs> yeah. and start to fight battles for you yeah. which is look, uh, that's lovely but also like that's also something where i like that's a that's a battlefield that doesn't need to be created on my page as well mm -hmm. so that's another thing where you're just like oh yeah yeah do i keep all these comments or do i just delete them mm -hmm. you know you, yeah it's it's a it's a whole web of 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 mess sometimes but anyway there is a comment that I used to use that I found disarmed almost every uh, negative situation, you know, with people who are upset with me or whatever. And that comment was, well, I'm sorry you didn't like the video, but I appreciate you taking the time to comment on the video because that really helps my channel and boosts the engagement. So more people will see this video. Uh, I said, even if you dislike the video, that also helps because it pairs my video up with content that you don't like that other people do like so thanks for right. helping me and then they just right. vanish after that interesting okay i've used to i used to i, I said a response similar to that a few times like thanks for helping the algorithm you know pick up my <laughs> video more and stuff like that on my podcast more but um 
my re the response to that I got from someone was, you just made that word up, meaning algorithm. And I'm like, oh, my God. OK, maybe so, that was a disinformation bot. <laughs> could have been a disinformation bot. You're right. Very, very good. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah the um the soundtrack to those types of those types of scenarios would be very different from the soundtrack Shirley Walker's done for Batman yeah I imagine like the music going through their head is a bit like the Charlie Collins theme from Joker's favor you know <laughs> you just named one of my favorites man I love that so much we uh that's uh what I like a classic for uh, me and my brother that yeah. we hum and sing all the time it's so bouncy and like it's just uh yeah it's i can't wait to get to that episode i've obviously seen it loads but um i'm excited to review it on the podcast yeah. it's coming up soon it's, it's a great example of how versatile shirley's theme and her music was in in batman in particular because you know she'd write these these really like gut-wrenching tragic tunes like from mask of the phantasm or clayface's theme and then she'd write something really jazzy, like the uh, Read My Lips, the um, Scarface episode. Yeah, what a score. And almost got him as well. I think she did almost got him. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think she did. Um, I'm really jazzy. She, she definitely did Read My Lips. And it's so the dong, 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 dong. Like, I love that stuff, like the stand up bass and all of that. Um, it's a shame, like, I, I when we decided to do this, when you asked, you know, what do I want to talk about? And music is, it's just my way into a lot of things because if I'm, if I'm busy, or if I'm doing something, you know, if I'm traveling somewhere, music can still go with me and I can still like yeah. have a bit of Batman or whatever I'm, I'm excited about at the time with me. You know, I can't mm -hmm. watch Batman, the animated series whilst I'm traveling to London or I'm doing this, but I can listen to the music and that's a nice connected piece. So that was my way in. I thought this would be a great topic to talk about. Because I think, I uh, I think we might do a music episode on our podcast. But frankly, we talk about the music of each episode as we review. Yeah. So I thought this would be great to do this on yours. But the problem is, is that because of uh, copyright strikes, I was thinking I was like, man, we're not going to be able to play anything, are we? We're just going to be humming it like a couple of nerds <laughs> to like one us. another. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah um but that's fine though yeah I, I love all of that stuff and i guess people listen to this like they know these scores um and i, I like i was going to ask you like do you have any uh what's your i'm not going to say your favorite but like top three or top five favorite shirley walker composed pieces of music okay so i've got i'll go with three i think that i can think of off the top of my head so i really love from mask of the phantasm i think it's called the birth of batman so it's that bit where bruce comes out of the the cave and he's the ring has been left behind from andreas says, you know left with dad too young need time forget about me and the music goes really high and then it yes. goes doo -doo 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 so low you can feel bruce's spirit being crushed and then it goes straight into the batman theme of oh, yeah <laughs> and it shows it shows Thomas and Martha, their portrait, yeah. you know, and also, as you said, going low, he's literally descending into the Batcave as the music descends and yeah. down into the Batcave as well. Uh, yeah, great, great Paul, man. That is, that's a really good one for sure. That one just breaks my heart every time I listen to it and I love it. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to say, following on a little bit from what you said about Clayface's theme, I'm going to go with the, the bit of music at the end from Mudslide, where... Clayface dives at Batman and knocks him over the edge of the cliff and they tumble towards the water and they, they play the Clayface theme, I think on a trumpet. I'm not like a yeah. music guy, but it's like, I can't even do it properly. Yes. Look at that. No, no, but I, know, I know what you're doing there. I know what you're talking about though. And yeah, the Clayface theme on a solo instrument like that, especially a wind instrument is, uh, or a horn, should I say is, yeah, is really something. That's a good one. I like yeah. that. And finally, I'm going to have to go with, the I think it's called Harvey's Nightmare. So the opening music from Two Face Part One. It's with that person playing the Two Face theme on a recorder. And what yes. I love about the choice of that instrument is, I don't know if it, this is the case globally, but in the UK, as you know, the recorder is an instrument that children learn. Yeah, they kind yep. of get their head around wind instruments. So immediately it makes you think of childhood, and it sounds really creepy, and it just ties in perfectly with 
Harvey Dent's backstory. Yeah, that's true. Actually, that's a really good point because it's a childhood trauma that he's like keeping a secret, isn't it? Because yeah. he was a bully as a kid. Um, yeah, that's a really good point, and uh, I I can I can tell you because I I I spent uh, from from birth till age ten in the UK, and then I moved to America and and grew up in America. Uh, we also learn recorders over there in America as well. So it is a is it a global instrument that people good. learn at a young age? Yeah. And it is a, it's got a creepy vibe, like, and that, that particular do, 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 like all of that is a very, like almost, it could work for a creepy clown, like Joker theme almost, because it sounds so unnerving, but yeah, because he's obviously being unnerved himself is a perfect piece of music that is Mm. on mine as, as as one is the two face theme in general is so well done. Kevin Altieri, when he was on a show, talked about how when um, uh, he was directing those two parter and he was working with with Bruce and everybody else in the studio and Shirley called them and said, I've, I've composed two face come over. You know, they were they weren't on the lot, but Shirley was on the lot, the Warner Brothers lot. Come down and check it out. So um, Kevin grabbed Bruce and they went down. And Shirley was like, okay, you know, like, you ready? This is it. And she played it. And after she played it, like Kevin and Bruce's faces were just like the jaws were on the floor. They were like, that was amazing. Yeah. And she's like, you know, please be honest. Like, is there any notes? What do you want to change? Like, you know, I'm unsure. And they're like, nothing. Change nothing. It's <laughs> inc- like, what are you talking about? That's like, don't touch it. And she, you know, they had they didn't have the full animated episode by then, but they had clips of it and she was, you know, the orchestra and everything was playing it over that. Like what, what a cool thing to, yeah. to be able to witness amazing That'd stuff. Amazing. Yeah. And you kind of just alluded to something that was really special about BTAS and obviously the music, you know, the, the topic of our conversation, compare the music from BTAS to other cartoons of, of the time, even afterwards, you'd have like, you know, Thundercats. Thundercats had cool music, but there was always like that action music, you know. Yeah. Be in every single episode. There would always be like Mumra's theme that would always play in the whenever the mutants or Mumra are around. Hell yeah, man. I loved all of that. Yeah, yeah. But I know I know what you mean. It's like there was a certain box that they kept a lot of the music in. They didn't yeah. ever open up the box and Batman opened that box up every single episode. They're like, yeah. okay, last week we did Clayface and that was tragedy. And this week we're doing Scarface, as you said, and we're going jazz and we're going yeah. gritty and like, you know, completely different vibe. Um, yeah. I like it's, it's almost, it's almost a huge part for me is the music. As I've said, like, the music of that show just it stands out today and it stood out to me as a five-year-old kid you know Mm -hmm. what i mean i'm like what like this is so different even back then this is capturing my attention like the man bat transformation sequence scared me as a kid scared it still scares me today but with shirley's like diddly 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 like those those strings going Mm -hmm. haywire like something really is happening like almost like you know the psycho scene when she's being stabbed you know it's just like this is scary this is scary you're freaking out and it's like it's in me batman and he transforms (laughs) like crazy you know and like uh shit i don't know if i can pick three men i've done two face and i'm like oh yeah on leather wings (laughs) But then there was others in my brain as well that I was like, oh, "This go is ahead, definitely... go ahead." I mean, you could list as many as you want. As I'm happy to talk uh, uh, about all of them. Those scenes, yeah, in particular, really stand out. Like the the scene. I guess the music is one thing, but it's like the scenes that the music are paired. What is that? What is that? I guess how visceral is it for me that I remember it? So I definitely have to say the Man Bat transformation sequence mm-hmm. with that music. And that 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 score in general, and it being the first one they ever produced, like that just set the tone for yeah, sure. Yeah, and there's there's um there are references to classical music in there. Like, yes. I don't know the the name of the classical music. As, as I said, I'm not really a musical guy, but it reminded me of the I think it's near the end of Fantasia with like the Devil Mountain or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's that's a good pull. Yeah, um, yeah, it's got it's just uh, that episode is a is a monster movie, right? It's a fifties mm-hmm. monster movie. That that episode, 
um, and even Kevin Altieri was was telling again on our, on when we had him on, he's like, we we did a monster because then we could get away with Batman beating the shit out of this monster, right? Like we wanted to set the tone. This is a very different show, and by doing a monster, it's scary. But also Batman, it's an opponent that Batman can face, you know, and can like really get like beaten up by and such. Like I know that they had some pullback on like, you know, you're allowed to do this because they they had a way around guns and all these other mm-hmm. things. They called them like Dark Deco guns or whatever. But Batman bleeds in that episode and they're like, ah, uh-uh, no more of that. <laughs> like we don't see him bleed again until Mask of the Phantasm, right? Because that yeah. was a movie. So that scene really stands out with the music for me. Um, I, another Shirley scene that really stands out to me is uh, I've said Two Face, obviously, and, and Clayface. We talked about all of those, but just the Joker's theme mm. in general. Like the first time we ever really hear the Joker's theme is in the Last Laugh. We, mm. even though he first appears in Christmas with the Joker. That's uh, that's not Shirley. He's doing that as well. I forget who's the composer on that. Um, but it's it's mostly Christmas music that's like got the Batman theme woven in, yeah. which I listen to every year. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's it's the the Joker's theme is like it's so what's the word? Um, it can just be it's so versatile. It can be used in mm-hmm. so on so many different instruments. Like the last laugh, it's all about him on a barge, right? Like mm-hmm. poisoning the city on a boat. So they've got like this like old timey um whatever those Top like the old is. whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. And it's played on that to begin with. But then as you go on, the different themes um for the Joker are all played on different instruments depending on what that is. So I just love the Joker theme in general. It's just such a strong theme. And I couldn't tell you the Joker theme from Batman 89. I really couldn't. There's the waltz, which I remember, but Danny Elfman mm. had some some leitmotif for Joker, but I really there's like beautiful dreamer is woven in as well. The na 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 um but that's an existing song already. Like Shirley created to me the 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 most iconic, the greatest Joker theme ever. Like when you hear dun 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 and it can be whistled or anything, it can be played like heavy or soft. You know the Joker's there. You're like the Joker is there. Um I think it's even in Master of the Phantasm when he first appears. But it's it's such a brilliant theme like in the way it's used in the laughing fish like the laughing fish that music is like that is that is a, a if i've ever seen in the entire show a huge tribute to bernard herman and what he did with alfred, Hitch, alfred hitchcock like it sounds like the music from psycho when she's like driving her car and she's like in the rain trying to look for the hotel mm. it sounds like in north by northwest when he's like on the train and he's being hunted by the goons trying to follow him, the police or whatever, the FBI. It's so Bernard Herman, it's incredible. Uh, and every time I watch The Laughing Fish, I'm like, this is a Hitchcock movie. This is crazy how much it sounds like a Hitchcock movie. So that really stands out. Hell, the Catwoman theme, the... Like, I can see a cat jumping across rooftops to that music it's light on its feet Mm -hmm. but it's mysterious and it like kind of weaves like a cat and like you know that's i may sound like i'm uh, just kind of being over descriptive here but that's how musicians think that when they're like designing this they they go very like okay cat woman what sounds like a cat it's kind of like what john barry did with the james bond scores like diamonds are forever what does a diamond sound twinkling you know let's make that and that's how diamonds are forever was born or what does underwater sound like you know for thunderball and like the descent into underwater and that's how thunderball was like all of that stuff i think really pairs well with the specific episode kind of like the specific movie like james bond has got a different score for each one because it fits that movie same with batman it's like let's do a different leitmotif and a different score for every single person and that is why I think, for me, at least, I continue to go back to this well of Batman because, yes, it is the perfect Batman. It's the best Batman we've ever seen on screen. But the music is also so unique and so powerful mm. and so recognizable 
that that again like that brings me back to my childhood but also as an adult i can appreciate it more and look at it through a different lens because i know a lot more about music and like and how composers work and they think and i don't get that from any other cartoon like spider-man the animated series is a great show it's the best spider-man i think and i we did a podcast on it because we felt that way but the music like they try to do some of it and there is some light motifs for certain characters but for the most part it's recycled like we recorded this many songs and we're going to keep on recycling it like mm-hmm. there's not like too many themes there's not like a specific theme for every single villain there's like a yeah. couple and they use it and they kind of spread it around um and yeah i think you know that's why batman just stands head and shoulders above the rest even the other shows in the dcau it's just it's just for me it's the music is a huge component of that yeah i agree and even in dare i say not very good episodes like i've got batman in my basement i know you don't mind that episode but i hate it (laughs) Um, it's still got really good music it does it has fantastic music in that episode i agree and that that kind of i think that carried us through that episode where we appreciate it more we root for the underdogs me and my brother so i think Mm. that's why like um we reviewed gray ghost recently and uh i love it and my brother still very much enjoys it but it wasn't as good as i remember on a rewatch and uh, dare i say you know like these ones that i feel like are untouchable are not actually that untouchable now when we're watching them and the ones that instantly get a bad rap we're just we're more receptive i guess it's that thinking of like if someone tells you i've just seen this movie and it's the best movie i've ever seen it's amazing you have to go see it. you have to go see it and they build it up when you go see it if the hype isn't living up to that expectation which nine times out of ten it's not because that person's put it on such a high pedestal you're gonna be like yeah that was all right like you know and you like pick it apart and rip it because they had a different experience than you because they went in not knowing it was going to be the best movie they've ever seen whereas if someone tells you this movie is shit it's really 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 bad sometimes you go in being like all right let's let's watch this piece of shit like what's going to happen here and it turns out you're like this is actually quite fun you know like you kind of you expect it to be so bad that you're in on the joke so mm-hmm. i think that's why we're we're a bit more forgiving and my brother with the underdwellers made a very good point where he said when bruce wayne took in that orphan the uh, frog <laughs> the name of the boy is frog <laughs> um you know that was that was a really good comparison he made to like even though bruce lost his parents he still has money and he still has Alfred and he has a home and he's safe. Whereas frog doesn't have parents. Mm-hmm. He's an orphan, but he doesn't have money. He doesn't have a home. He's not safe. And he's been, you know, put into this chain gang in the sewers and like, you know, put into servitude by this horrible, evil person with crocodiles walking around. And Missouri King is ridiculous, but the whole idea of Bruce, being so angry when he sees all those kids like he almost kills the sewer king you know yeah. because he's gone he's gone way he's messed with children it's like he knows how scarring that can be and he brings the kid back to wayne manor and he yeah. like shows him what life can be like and the kid, you know he he has fun for the first time probably ever because he feels safe so if that's changed your mind everybody on underdwellers then uh, good because that that changed my mind on the whole episode i thought it was a very good point yeah yeah that is an excellent point and i i would just this is something i often say um even the worst episode of batman the animated series is better than most of the stuff that came before so it's kind of like being the world's shortest giant right you're not as tall as everybody else but you're still head and shoulders above everyone else yeah that's a good point yeah uh, absolutely yeah uh, i i don't think I don't think we're going to hate on any episode like yeah we make fun of it but we love it and there's just things that we've like we made fun of underdwellers of course we did like who doesn't but um yeah there's there's so many good factors uh, about batman as well and i think i would put batman's worst episode up against like cartoons from the early 80s and the best episode of that and it batman would still win hands down no question Yeah. yeah just compare it with the super friends exactly right like yeah look at that and the music and that is is you know it's, it's one theme that they use consistently and yeah 
yeah that show oh that show it's just oof. yeah well <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, i'm having the conversation by bringing it up yeah <laughs> good god yeah Oh, so there, there's one other theme I wanted to mention that just popped into my head. And uh, that's the theme for The Forgotten with all that like bluesy, like, oh, I don't know, so guitar, much. bass and um, harmonica. That's the instrument I was trying to think. Of. How yeah. did I not? Like, honestly, man, thank you so much for mentioning that, because that is like th- not my favorite score, but my favorite guilty pleasure score. <laughs> And it's not on the animated series soundtracks. It's not. You have to go on YouTube to listen to it. It is so, on one of the later volumes. Um, if you like, I can share. I've got all the soundtracks. I got them all before they went out of print. If you want, I can copy them over and I'll send them your way. I'll share a folder. Oh, yeah, because I can't listen to that on my phone unless I go to YouTube. Yeah. Um, but I didn't get copywritten because I played like a good chunk of that on our podcast and you know our podcast goes out on all the podcast platforms and then i also create like a looping video for youtube mm-hmm. and put it on a youtube channel and um it didn't get copywritten for that and that song man like if if you can edit it in it's just like it's the it's it's instantly like makes me want to get up and like do something like Start running yeah, it's like dun, 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 bam, 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 and you just like you got that, and then it like breaks down, and it's like dun, 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 dun and you got this like muted guitar riff, and then the horns are like dun, 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 and it's just, I mean, again, I'm singing into the microphone like an idiot, but <laughs> I love that score, and that do 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 is played in like sad or like action beats, you know, it works really well. And it's just a one-off new piece of music for an episode that like it's called the forgotten most people because they forget about that episode yeah um and again i love that episode it's my guilty pleasure it's just so much fun it's so random it's the episode which you know it's the trope of uh, superman loses his powers or spider-man loses his powers well batman can't lose his powers but he can lose his memory which essentially is losing his powers and that's why they did it um but yeah, that piece of music is so random for where wherever this desert is outside of Gotham City, which is very odd. Like, where's that out on the outer city limits? Yeah, same place as that Yucca Springs resort from the uh, Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's very similar, actually. Um, yeah, that's such a good piece of music, that. Thank you for reminding me of that one. Oh, you're welcome. I love it, too. I mean, I love all of all of the music in this show. I can't think of a single episode where I've gone, oh, the music's not very good. In, yeah. you know, a hundred odd episodes, even in the new Batman adventures when they obviously had a reduced budget because, you know, you can just tell from the sound. Mm. Um, even the music then was excellent. Yeah, Nightwing's theme is great. Like, yeah. that's one of the ones that I remember hearing in that show and I'm like, oh, this is a really good theme. Yeah, so that's... It, yeah, it, it carries over into the new Batman Adventures. Not the same, but yeah, I know what you mean. It's still there. Right. That seems like a good point to end off because we have been recording for God knows how long. <laughs> what, about an hour and a half? That's that's a good yeah, amount of episode. That's, that's, yeah, I can talk, man. I'm sorry. No, no, this is excellent because I can as well. When I've done my recent guest episodes, they've all ran for over two hours. <laughs> so it's a real yeah. pain in the backside editing them <laughs> i'm very yeah i'm sorry I, I, I was thinking that i was like oh my god because i you know I, well i was gonna ask you but i forgot like do you edit and stuff because obviously some people don't some people are like no I, you know i just kind of play it like i did a podcast recently where someone just played the entire interview including like me being like hang on one second excuse me and then like achoo you know what i mean and like that's wow. in the pod i'm like come on dude like yeah. put a bit more in. but i'm glad you edit but yeah sorry that it's gonna be a lot of do not apologize lot. it's it's always worth worth it when you're having a good conversation no matter how long it is oh cheers man yeah i've enjoyed this um it's been good i'd love to come back on and talk about other themes and and whatnot for the dcau i'm always up for talking about that stuff excellent well you're welcome back anytime Cool. Um, is there anything else you wanted to discuss before we bring it to a close? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me do some some plugs and stuff. 
Yeah, so uh, for anyone, again, that uh, doesn't know, I do a podcast with my brother, Batman the Animated Series podcast, available on all podcast platforms and YouTube. We started doing uh, video reviews as well in the sense mm. of we're taking our podcast audio, and because I do all of these mini videos for social media where I take clips of our podcast, the best bits, and, and overdub the, the animated series over it and make it look like we're... we're the characters talking um i've had a lot of great responses from people and i've had a lot of people say can you just do a full episode review like this i'd love to see that not having any idea how long the editing process will take for that and how pains i have an encyclopedic knowledge of batman but like that that's some work you know it's 20 minutes yeah. of review that i'm condensing down but uh, i've done it i've done uh, heart of ice so far and beware the gray ghost which is available on our youtube at batman tas pod so please go check that out if you haven't liked the video that helps us out a lot and then also my brother comic book artist and writer as i said he is currently uh kickstarting his second issue of outbreaks which is a zombie anthology series of books it's essentially like black mirror meets the walking dead where black mirror is about technology and exploring all different facets of that this is all about zombies and exploring the genre of zombies and not just the traditional survival stories but like what does the a zombie story look like in a film noir 1940s setting or what does it look like in this or from the perspective of a dog you know and like mm -hmm. things like that which we've really he's 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 helmed it there's one or two stories um, I've co-created with him, but there's so many stories that he's created. He's got some amazing talent behind it. Um, so go check it out on Kickstarter. It's called Outbreaks. You can head to speechcomics.com, which is his comic book company, and you can check it out there and it will lead you to it. Or you can find him at Robson Inc. I N K on the socials. Go check it out there. He's posting videos all the time. And yeah, if you can share the Kickstarter or support it in any way, that's a huge help to him. So thank you. Yeah, send me a link to it and I'll put it in the description for the podcast as well. Cool. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, man. Yeah. And you're quite the TikTok sensation as well, aren't you? <laughs> uh I've I've had some luck. Yeah, it's been good. <laughs> um that's been a that's been a really great way to introduce listeners to our podcast, which has been awesome. So yeah, go check us out on socials, TikTok, uh, everywhere at Batman T A S Pod One except for the app formerly known as Twitter, because someone took that handle. So I had to do at Batman TAS pod one. Um, yeah, but everywhere else, I think I actually just said that at Batman TAS pod one everywhere, which is not true. <laughs> don't I, check I, them out. They're impersonators. Don't check that, yeah. So yeah, at, at Batman TAS pod one is on Twitter for us because everywhere else we're at Batman TAS pod. Um, so yeah, you, you, if you guys want to check us out, see some of our videos, TikTok, YouTube, check us out there. All right, great. Well, thank you, Alex, for your time, and uh, hope we speak again soon. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Should we sing a theme to to end oh, this? Which one? <laughs> oh, there's too many. Well, to I from. guess I guess just the end theme for Batman. The <laughs> dun, 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 <laughs> I've gone into Danny Elfman then. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it is at the end. So yeah, there we go. True. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. You're welcome. So I got ready to upload this podcast after Mary had edited it. And then I remembered, oh my God, we haven't done the comments. <laughs> and you might have just heard Mary laughing there. So Mary's back after her nasal surgery. I think she's, what, 90% recovered? Oh, yeah. I am like 90, 95% recovered. Good. So I do apologize that I am not in the guest portion of this episode. That day that it was recorded, I woke up at 2.45 in the morning to go to work and I was thoroughly exhausted by by the end of it and i'm sure alex completely understood and yeah. i listened to the podcast and, and i you edited, edited it mm. yeah i was while i was editing it and i was i was quite jealous because i uh, i wasn't there because alex seems like such an interesting fella and hopefully we can have him back mm -hmm. and i can pick his brain on a few things yeah. by the way thank you so much alex for for just joining in our little podcast and it's it's extremely awesome to have people like him just just as a friend really because he's 
become a friend of yours, hasn't he, Luke? Or because of because of. I this. mean, I guess so. We chat occasionally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's it's so nice to to be able to speak to people and and share similar interest in this in this huge world. Yeah. And you know, we're not just you know spreading nonsense and stuff not, like that. We're not just that. Yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. sometimes, but yeah. <laughs> That's kind of an explanation on why I wasn't in this one. But I will be in future episodes. Yeah. So the next one we recorded was, it's our Batman Day special. So I suppose that's a little announcement. So Batman Day is on the 16th of September, which is at the time of recording next Saturday. Ooh. So that means you're going to get an episode earlier than usual. And then we'll be back two weeks after that. Do we have a guest for that one? Yes, we do. We recorded it a <laughs> long time ago. I was trying to have some like... Duh, 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 duh. Uh, shall I just say who it is? Yeah, I think you should say who it is. Okay, so it's uh, a very fine gentleman by the name of Stephen Trumbull who has made a animated Batman film called Batman Broken Promise. Beautiful. Yeah, it's really excellent. Very well made. I was very impressed by it. Hence why we invited him on the podcast. They were like, oh, please, let's talk about your movie some more. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we had a great conversation with him. We only booked an hour. We ended up talking for nearly two and a half hours. And yeah. We edited it down to, what, just over two hours? But, yeah, we had a really great conversation with Stephen talking about a, a number of uh, Batman-related topics. Not just his film, not just the things that yeah. inspired him and influenced him, but just generally what he thinks makes a good Batman. And it's a really great conversation. I know it's a long one. I know this is a long one. I know the last one was a long one. But it's my podcast. I can just <laughs> do whatever I want. I can edit it for however long I want it to go for. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> you can always listen to it in chunks if you like. I should say it's our podcast. <laughs> but anyway, let's get to some questions. Okay, so let's go through the comments from the last episode, which was on the, the DC Films Influence on the DC Animated Universe and vice versa. So, yeah, so we've got a small number of questions this week. So for a, uh, a, a comment here from Milo's Batman video says, wait, you have a thanks button. Yes, I do. So a thanks button is like a little tip thing. Mary's looking at me with a confused face. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a tip button. You know, like, I like this guy. Here's a dollar or whatever. Oh, so, Nito, I could do that to you. Well, <laughs> thanks, thanks for always doing the dishes when I forget. <laughs> Which is everyday thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's not even joking. No, I'm not. Um, but yeah, I mean, no pressure. No one has to use that. If you want to, great, fantastic. I appreciate it. But if no one ever does it, that's fine. It's fine by me. I will say this. If you do hit the thanks button, I will start including gilly pictures. I'll put <laughs> gilly toes in this. Yeah, so she's talking about our cat Gilgamesh before anyone gets confused. <laughs> uh, okay, so next we had two comments from RDP16 Rules. Oh, so hi. First one's more of a statement, and then he's got uh, some questions afterwards. So I assume it's a he. I apologize if I got you they. used the wrong pronouns. Uh, okay, so first of all, quite a long comment, but I'll try to get through it. Another great Totally Shway podcast. Thank you very much. Hopefully this video will get more views soon because the content inside is fantastic. I don't really mind about views, you know. I mean, when I put the the poll out asking my audience if they would listen to a podcast, only 10% of people said definitely out of like 1,300 respondents. So as long as 130 people listen, I'm okay. Well, thank you so much for, for, being, for, for being nice and for listening. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, our numbers like on a monthly basis are fairly consistent. I'm fairly like transparent around like views and stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, our podcast gets between six and 800 listens a month, um, which, you know, it's I think it's fairly low level, yeah, but it doesn't bother me. We're not doing this for fame and money. It's it's just something to do. Yeah, and it's something that we can do together because you have, obviously, the rest of your YouTube channel, but, but this one, it's something that we can do together and connect to other people mm -hmm. and just connect on a different level yeah. and actually be able to do something that isn't... It's not hurting anybody, and it's talking we about, know of. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's talking about stuff that we like. So to continue with the comment then, uh, admittedly, I probably saw the Burton Batman films too early, five or six. I think I was the same age. I might even have been a little bit younger than that. Uh, my dad bought it for us on VHS and my brother and I watched it pretty much every day for about four years. I know that it was one of the first 
movies that I went to the theater to see. Oh, well. But I'm going to be honest with you, at four, I believe I was, I don't remember actually going to the cinema. Mm. And I was only recently told this by my mom yeah. um, over a Facebook message. But most of the adult content flew over my head for years. I hold such a deep appreciation for them both. Controversies surrounding the Flash movie aside, Michael Keaton is still my favourite live-action Batman, which is kind of weird as I saw the Schumacher and Nolan films in theatres. So to hear just how much BTS borrowed from this movie is so interesting. It's kind of common knowledge, but it's nice to hear it all laid out like this. It's hard to know one way or the other, but perhaps next time a video ends up approaching two hours, it can be split into two parts. Now the problem I have there... Where do I make the cut? Because we ramble and meander and there's no real <laughs> like good place to cut most of the time. Yeah. Um, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. It's something yeah. we can think about in the future. It's a fair suggestion. And yeah. perhaps if I'm more structured and more organized, maybe. <laughs> also, by the way, do I did I hear the word theater? Mm-hmm. So we might have another American on our hands. Yeah, most, most of my audience are American. <laughs> That's actually. awesome. Hey, guys. Um, maybe then more people will watch then instead of adding videos to their watch later list. Just a suggestion. Hopefully it helps. I'm going to post my question in a separate comment, which I'm going to go to now. Just know that I'm a proud viewer of the channel. Keep up the great work. Yeah, it was very nice of you like, to honestly, say. Honestly, we look forward to your comments. <laughs> Like we really, well, I do anyway. I'm sure Luke does too. <laughs> but it's it's really lovely to see this some of the same people commenting on you know all of our videos, and sometimes it's just nice to be able to to see that you guys have have watched and mm. also are enjoying some of the content and would like to see other content and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So as for RDP sixteen rules is questions. Hashtag totally shway. Hashtag totally shway. First question. Do you think BTAS would have had the same impact if it had been based on the Dark Knight trilogy? I love those movies, but personally, I don't think they lend themselves well to animation. Well, except for Gotham Knights. Um, I think that the reason BTAS had such an impact is that it is the time that it came along. Because in the late 80s, I mean, for most of the 80s and the early 90s, the very early 90s, Cartoons were very simplistic and they were designed to just to sell toys, whereas BTAS was designed to be a work of art and they didn't really care if they sold toys. I know that the the fine folks at Kenner did. I think it was Kenner. Well, yeah, it was Kenner. Um, and the Warner Brothers execs probably cared quite a lot, but the people working on BTAS, they just wanted to make a great cartoon and they succeeded. Thoughts, Mary? I don't really have any thoughts about it because I just think... It, it it doesn't really matter what it, what it was based on in the end. I think the writers um, and the creators of of that show would have made it a masterpiece no matter what because the writers and you know the producers, the editors, all of that um, were made were what made that really great for me. And I think if they would have based it on anything else, it would have been just as great. By Fair. the way, I support SAG. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I support the writer's strike. Yeah. Pay people. Pay them the way that you would want to be paid. If you wrote a storyline, a script, a commercial, a movie, a TV show, pay them. Because that audience, every time they they watch that, they are, you know, that story is being shown again and again and again. They deserve the money that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Tangent over. So the second question is, have you seen any of the DC animated films that started with Superman Doomsday? Half of them are standalone films, but they also made a series of them with a full continuity. I love those films and follow them pretty heavily. Could make for an interesting podcast if nothing else. I've seen all of them. Mary, you've seen a bunch of them. I've seen a bunch of them, yeah. Like the New Frontier was, was Oh, one. oh, don't even get me started on how much I love that movie. Like, it is one of my favorite animated movies. The storyline, to me, was, was great. It wasn't too long. The voice acting, chef's kiss. <laughs> yeah, I would like to rewatch that i can't even i don't remember how many times i've seen it but i've seen it i've seen it a few but i would like to rewatch some of the movies that i've already seen 
But I've, I would also like to watch some of the movies that are, are on Max that I haven't seen. Because I like, I don't know if, if I'm um, a basic autumn girly here, but I love watching movies when it's super cold outside. And I love those animated movies because it makes me feel like, it makes me go back to after school cartoons again for some reason. Mm. I've got that really fond memory of like watching TV with my brother and all of that when it was like quite cold because, you know, school didn't start till August and it started getting colder outside. Mm. Well, we were only talking about watching All-Star Superman the other day because um, you've been watching Desperate Housewives again. The guy that plays, is it Mike? Yeah. Mike Mike Delfino. See, I can hear it from my office. Yeah. So. I've kind of absorbed all this stuff through osmosis. What is his name again? Uh, the actor. I, I can't remember. Oh, what is his name? Oh. But he plays Superman in, yeah. in Star Superman. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm rewatching Desperate Housewives because I really don't. I'm I'm so hot right now. Yeah, it's very warm. <laughs> that I want to have something on in the background that I've already seen that I can just have on in the background. I'm not going to pay that much attention to while I have the loud air conditioner on. I actually don't remember a lot of the last season, but I know most of it. So I, mm. I'm just like, I could play Stardew Valley and do that. Meanwhile, I absorb all the information into my brain. And like, I've never watched this show, but I know who all the characters are and yeah. how awful they all are. They're all awful people. Ex- shut up. Anyway, this isn't a Desperate Housewives. <laughs> this isn't a Desperate Wives. Shut wi- up. Uh, this is not a Desperate Housewives podcast. So join me next week when I have Desperate Who? Desperate Me. The Mary Mears Desperate Housewife podcast. <laughs> now available on Spotify. You now and myspace.com so final question uh from rdp 16 rules do you think an adaptation of no man's land would have worked in btas it's the first comics to introduce harley quinn as a regular character and probably help make her the fan favorite she is today so no man's land is when the earthquake hits gotham city and it gets demolished and it gets shut off from the rest of the states and they have to fend for themselves um, I have an opinion on this. So basically Gotham's in ruins and it's they get abandoned by the US government and nobody can come in and come out. And it's basically open warfare with gangs taking over territory. And it's about how Batman reclaims all the territory, takes over Gotham. Okay, hear me out. It's Hurricane Katrina in it's Gotham. It's Risk, but Batman. Or Strategio. Does anybody remember Strategio? I, I don't I don't understand. It's where he's he's claiming back all of the, the little areas. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, you know, one storyline he'll fight off yeah. the ventriloquist and Scarface who have got this area. Yeah. And then he hands it over to it's, the GCPD. It's strategio. Right, okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah. But that'd be awesome actually. That'd be a pretty yeah. cool storyline. Yeah, I think it would be very cool as well. And in one of the No Man's Land specials, I think it was the the Secret Origins or whatever it's Secret Files, excuse me. They did do a Batman Gotham Adventures style story set in No Man's Land, mm-hmm. uh, and it worked fine for me. And in fact, in the in Batman Beyond, they talk about the near apocalypse of oh nine, possibly oh eight, can't remember exactly um, when it was. They never went into any details as to what it was, other than I think it involved Rachel Ghoul. And I like to think in my personal head canon that Rachel Ghoul did something that caused an earthquake. Uh, Gotham was destroyed and that's how it got rebuilt and just looks so futuristic now so it it was kind of like their version of No Man's Land cool in my head that's how it happened Hmm. there's no evidence that that is the case at all but you heard it here first it's definitely what happened 100% conspiracy theory yeah okay so uh, just to finish things off here we've got an update on Blue the Chicken from Screen Wiper yes bring it in bring it in Blue is doing very well health-wise. Yes, Queen. The three new hens are settling in well, gaining confidence and their personalities are coming through. Wilma is sweet and introverted and at the bottom of the pecking order. (laughs) Betty is sweet band extroverted and keeps going in my house. They both talk to me a lot. Pebbles is the smallest and masks her insecurities behind aggression, which has put her second in the pecking order. It also gets her told off sometimes, so she's a bit scared of me. Blue is at the top, of course. Nobody dares try to change that. So I'm noticing a Flintstones Flintstones! Thing. Yeah. My Flintstones vitamins! <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so Blue has taken on quite a motherly role in looking after the new ones, oh. and they often follow her around the garden and often copy her, especially lately. Today I've started trying to take advantage of this by putting Blue's food in the mechanical feeder, hoping the younglings will copy her. <laughs> because they need to be using it before winter and before Blue gets sick again, which will hopefully be a long way away, yeah. but you never know. So far, they're scared of the feeder moving and making a clang when they close it hard, but they should get used to that. The three new hens each lay an egg every day, and they're good, delicious eggs. Nice to get eggs from hens I 100% know are happy. <laughs> so it's going absolutely lovely with the hens, and I'm enjoying it very much while it lasts. Uh, P.S. Blue's old pack used to live in a different garden, and, <laughs> and there were magpies there, and the magpies used to love winding up the hens. Taking the piss when they were locked in the run, aviary was their favourite. If they weren't locked up, the hens would chase the magpies away and then the two species would then shout at each other from a distance. It was all very funny to watch. Oh, I am so... That's honestly made my, my whole week. Because I, I think about <laughs> Blue. <laughs> Ever since you first told us about, obviously, the, the unfortunate sickness that she she had. Um, I really... I look forward to your updates, honestly. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're connected yeah, I do. I love it. And I'm so happy that the the the, the chickadees, the the Flintstones are are adapting really well with Blue. Blue's going to be a good mama. <laughs> Have we told them about the parakeets? Yeah. Yeah, we've mentioned it in the pets okay. episode, I think. That was just random like a dozen parakeets just turning up outside yeah. our flat. Yeah. I think about it on a daily basis. Yeah, they've not come back since then. It's really <laughs> weird. Um, okay, so that was all of the comments and the questions, I believe. If do I've you, missed one, I apologise. Do you have any updates or news? or? Yeah, so just one last thing I wanted to talk about very quickly is that by now, hopefully, you'll all have seen this big project I've been working on for the last uh, nearly two weeks. Uh, I'm doing a commentary track for Batman Mask of the Phantasm with directors Dan Reber and Kevin Altieri, as well as storyboard artist Brad Rader. Now, they all worked on Mask of the Phantasm and have got some amazing insights, and they've shared loads of behind-the-scenes material that I'm going to edit into the, the video as well. Ideally, the way it would work is that, okay, you've got your copy of Mask of the Phantasm, you put it in, you press play, you sync up with my video, press play on that on your phone, and then you listen and maybe have a glance at the, the phone every now and then to see the material that the, the guys are talking about. It was really great to sit down and talk with them. I booked the call for like an hour and a half, and we ended up talking for like two and a half hours. A lot of the conversation was like off the air, and they were just like telling me about you know their experiences of working with people like um, jack kirby and stan lee and todd mcfarlane um it was all really interesting stuff i was just sat there most of the time just listening to them going what the hell is my life what what is happening right now where am i that must have felt really great it must have uh, checked off a, a a childhood um i guess not goal or dream but just like like damn it i've i've seen these people and i love it so much yeah the, the, the it's just wild to me that not only do they know who i am but they've said they actually want to talk to me i'm like oh yeah okay that's that's my <laughs> husband y'all people want to talk to him yeah usually when people want to talk to me it's for bad stuff like, <laughs> <laughs> But no this, comment. No, but this was all good. And I mean, I got so embarrassed when uh, they gave, well, Dan Reba gave me a compliment and I just went, oh my God. <laughs> Luke is terrible at taking, I think both of us are kind of terrible at taking compliments, but you, oh my God, yeah. he will self-deprecate like as soon as it happens. Like he's like, you know, like, oh, Luke, you, you have a great smile. And he he will find a reason for you, or he, he will make up a reason for you not to like it, just because <laughs> he's that uncomfortable. Yeah. So it was, it was great. It was great of them to. I mean, I suppose in a way it validates a lot of what I've what I've been doing. Yeah. And I wasn't seeking validation, but I've got it, and it's it's, it's nice. And yeah. It was really wonderful, and I hope everyone enjoys listening to it. I really want this to be successful to kind of send a message to Warner Brothers that. For God's sake, you should be bringing these people in to share their recollections of these products you're selling. You know, since since we recorded the last episode, Arlene Sorkin has died. 
Yeah, I wanted to touch on that, but yeah. I'm not sure if we have enough time. Well, we can talk about it briefly. But essentially, all her knowledge and all of her experience is now gone. And it's not been recorded anywhere. When um, Michael Reeves died, he was one of the writers. I know who Michael Reeves is. That's it. All his knowledge and all his experience gone. Yeah. Kevin Conroy died. Okay, there have been a lot of interviews with yes. Kevin, so we've got yes. a lot of his yes, yes. his thoughts and his recollections stored. Thankfully. But Boyd Kirkland, you know, he was one of the directors. He died a while ago, actually. There aren't very many interviews with him. A lot of them were all text-based on, you know, superhero cartoon fan sites that no longer exist. They're really hard to find. So if anybody out there is listening from Warner Brothers... Don't and, sue me. Well, obviously, don't <laughs> sue. Uh, we're not trying to harm. We want you to buy the 4K copy. We want you to, you know, support all of the people that worked on this. But if you guys want to just um, work with us... No, nah, they don't have to No, I'm that. just kidding. And, and, and being uh, not funny, Warner Brothers, please, please try to to do things like this because just like Luke said we are losing some vital people mm. and we really really need to be able to you know like when you do those bronze shoes as a kid let's let's do that for all of the people that worked on on Warner Brothers movies mm -hmm. animations all of that let's please preserve your talent and that's not just mm -hmm. the voice actors that's the directors the writers the editors yeah. the people that put the shows the movies everything together yeah yeah and the thing is so everybody as far as i know everybody that worked on the film was credited yes but there's no explanation of who did what who came up with this who came up with that yeah so for instance there's that infamous scene where um andrea's beating the joker and he's like laying back on his kitchen counter and he reaches behind him and there's a knife there and some bologna. He grabs the bologna and beats her around the face with it. Yeah. Now, he could have grabbed the knife and just murdered yeah. her, but he chose not to. That wasn't in the script. Kevin Altieri came up with the idea of the Joker hitting her with bologna. Brad Rader drew it out. So that sequence, that thing that everybody really loves, yeah. is because of those two. And yeah. no disrespect to anybody, you know, any of the writers or any of the other directors... But it was their this, work. But this is also why you should preserve yeah. the individual creators because it's not just it's not just one show to people. It mm. is it's it's multiple episodes that multiple people worked on each mm -hmm. episode. And unfortunately, in in this day and age, like you've said, we have lost a lot of the information. Yeah. And you know the goodies, as as I, as I would you know say in my head. Like I am a fan of the old school DVDs. You know, like when DVDs first came out, it was such a big thing to have like featurettes on like mm -hmm. the the directors, the the this is like the production. You've got um, another great thing that they used to do were just video galleries mm -hmm. of of pictures you didn't get online because it wasn't that big at the time, and you don't. You know, like on the Mask of the Phantasm, you have one featurette. Yeah, I mean it's a good one. It's a yes, documentary. of course it is, and I'm I'm gonna probably watch it a bu a bunch of times. But it's one featurette that, you know, it's decades old, but it it should have so much more because mm -hmm. the writers, the producers, the editors. I'm gonna say it all. Yeah, storyboard the, artists. You know, there's yes the background painters. Everybody needs to have their moment to shine yeah. and unfortunately when it comes to animation i mean with a lot of things but specifically animation a lot of those people do get left behind in terms of um yes they'll get credited for it but it's it's not like yeah it's not the credit that they deserve they need to they need to shine just as yeah. bright as everyone else yeah and um i spoke about this briefly with niall on the last podcast niall from bat minute and he said that, you know, oh, you know, people call the DC animated universe the Timverse because it's the brainchild of Bruce Tim. And I suppose in a way, yes, it is. But it's it's more than that. It's not just him. He didn't come up with all of this stuff. If it was just him and Paul Dini, we would have had the um, the content that was in the Batman animated series writer's Bible. A lot of it wasn't very good, by the way, like Killer Croc being a big game hunter that got bitten by an exotic lizard and turned into a crocodile man. 
Now that's just... I'm so glad we didn't get that. A lot of this stuff comes from Alan Burnett. I mean, I could go on. I could just list off people. Like, oh, Dan Reba came up with this thing. And, yeah. And... and that's the thing. But, we, you know, I think whenever we get a chance to, we should shine that that spotlight on, on everyone because they, they deserve that individual, yeah. you know, shout out. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, we are having, and I'm going to bring it up again, in the in the states with SAG and everything, they're they're on um, they're on strike. the The Writers Guild are on strike, and for good reason, because it's not just about money. I know a lot of I've seen a lot of YouTube videos talking about, oh, they're just doing this because they're not paid enough. Well, yeah, they're not paid enough. Writers have never been paid enough. They're paid pennies compared to a lot of the actors. But also, it's it's the fact that they need credit, and 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 give them credit where credits due, and not just a small little, you know, credit at the at the end of the movie. That's the you know behind the twenty million studios and mm-hmm. and all of this that worked on the film. Yeah. Or you know, sometimes the studio gets more credit than than the writers, and I just that boggles my mind yep oh, and, and the storyboard artist as well because without in animation without the storyboard artist to actually put those things together you would not have the you know the b task mm. the batman beyond the justice league the superman we have today mm. yeah and just speaking of my experiences with brad raider he's great he's so generous with his material we love you brad there's i've there's been cases where i've come across gatekeeping where essentially you know someone will go i've got this information but i'm not sharing it with anyone i'm keeping it secret and apparently there are some like professionals that are like that as well assholes um <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can you can cut that out if you no, that's fine i mean i agree i agree um whereas so what i'm trying to do is brad's shared his storyboards with me he's he shared the storyboards for about 10 episodes it takes me a little while, but I've been making these little animatics out of the storyboards and I've been including the audio from the episodes. Now, I don't monetize these because one, it's not my work. Yeah. And two, I mean, it's it's the it's got the voice over and the sometimes the music from the show as well. So uh, like the Feet of Clay ones, those have been copyright matched by Warner Brothers. And that's fine. Warner Brothers can have all the analytics and they can run ads on it if they want. Fine, whatever. So long as this is allowed to exist and people can see it word that's the important thing word. if they copyright uh, strike one of my videos i'd be furious but, <laughs> but you don't know how long i spent on those damn videos essentially my thought process is 50 years from now no one's going to give a damn what i thought about bane right but 50 years from now people will still be watching batman the animated series they'll still watch mask of the phantasm and there will be people particularly animation enthusiasts that will think god i wonder what led to this decision i wonder who came up with that idea and these videos that i'm making are designed to keep a log of this information so you know 50 years from now someone could sit down and watch mask of the phantasm on their smell of vision and load up on their their <laughs> you know, their their chip in their brain that lets them see youtube on their eyes and they can play the the commentary track at the same time yeah and that that will still work that'll yeah. still be functional though they, they won't give a crap about my analysis of baby doll we should do a video a podcast of my analysis of baby doll <laughs> <laughs> and well we talked about doing a, a video about your favorite episode haven't we yeah can we talk about arlene for a little bit so you know you you have these moments in life where you think oh if if somebody passes away or um like if an actor passes away or a singer or anything you're like oh that's that's a bummer and then you have those moments where it's like wow that that person actually meant a lot more mm-hmm. to me than some people in my in my family <laughs> i know that that sounds dramatic but it's true no, it because true. arlene's voice was such a big part of my my childhood that I didn't realize that it did it, it 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 meant so that she meant so much to me until you know until you you told me she passed mm-hmm. and 
obviously I've, I'm a fan of Harley Quinn. I've been a fan of Harley Quinn since 1992 before it was popular, you know? And I think it's a huge part because, because of her, it would not, there would be no Harley without Arlene. Mm-hmm. And Harley to me is, is a great character because she is imperfect and she's just trying to get by and she's just trying to get love. She knows deep down that the Joker probably doesn't love her back, but she still tries. And I think, you know, that kind of hits home for me sometimes with, with, um, certain things in my childhood. And, you know, just, just because of that, I don't just think Arlene's death was a bummer. I really think that it, it was, it, it meant something. Uh, it was deeper than just hearing mm. that, you know, a celebrity had died. Yeah, and I, I gather she'd been unwell for a long time. Uh, I remember hearing her do a phone interview on Justin Michaels' Batman the Animated Podcast, and she didn't sound very well then. She mm. sounded quite frail, uh, but that was like five years ago. But uh, one of the things that's become abundantly clear to me is just how influential she was. Like, Harley Quinn yeah. became... Uh, an important character in Batman the Animated Series because of Arlene yeah. and her performance. She was intended to be a done, uh, a one-and-done character. She didn't even have a name in the first script. Uh, Joker's favourite. I think she was down as Joker's henchwench. That's what Mark Hamill says. And when they, like the, the creative team, saw the animation with coupled with that voice and that performance, they were like, oh my god, we've got to bring her back. And so much of the personality and like, the situations that happened in Harley episodes were inspired directly by Arlene Sorkin. So, for instance, in Harley's Holiday, there's two things. She's on a pair of roller skates. That ties into her appearance on, um, what's that soap opera called? Days of, the, Days of Our Lives? I think it was Days of Our Lives, yeah. yeah. Days of Our Lives, where um, she plays a jester that's on roller skates. So that, yeah. was, that was the immediate inspiration there. And the whole incident that kicks everything off with uh, the security tag being left on the dress and the misunderstanding with the security guard. Kevin Altieri told me that that was inspired by a real-life incident that happened with Arlene's friend, and she had related it to Paul Dini, talking about how funny it was. And then Paul Dini just wrote it in to the episode. It's so amazing how one person can make such a a difference in... in, in Just by knowing (laughs) that person, you know, the writers, the creators, Mm -hmm. and, and all of that... They, you know, they created a character out of out of this this marvelous woman. Yeah. And again, that performance, like in, in as a whole, Harley Quinn. Um, I just I I can't think of another character that I that I liked more when I was mm-hmm. a kid. Well, other than Batman, but in terms of female characters, I don't think. Because Harley Quinn was smart. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't think that, but you have to you have to admit sometimes you saw that that you know that smarts and it wasn't just street smarts. It was like she was an intelligent person, mm-hmm. but she did not want to, you know, she didn't want to be in that mold that everybody wanted to put her in or what normal or or whatever. And and seeing that as a kid. I think that's kind of what <laughs> it kind of helped get me and some of my weird out, I guess. <laughs> but um, it's it's nice that a, a a character was created on a kids show mm-hmm. that that made me feel like I wasn't the weirdest girl in the world. If that makes sense, I hope I, I'm making sense here because you are. It's just Harley Quinn isn't just, you know, um, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie did a fantastic job. But when I think of Harley Quinn, I think of Arlene. Mm -hmm. Because that character would not have made it. That character wouldn't have her own movie without Arlene. Mm -hmm. With, with, I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Yeah, I mean, she wouldn't exist without Arlene. Exactly. Uh, just one other thing I wanted to relay before we close up. Um, this always sounds so poncy when I say it. Ten but... hours later. No, this always sounds really poncy when I say it, but one of my art dealers sent an, sent me an email. <laughs> I know, I know. He's a guy that sells Batman animated series art, right? Technically, he is an art dealer. My art dealer. Yeah, he's one off. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But he sent an email out to uh, his clients about Arlene Sorkin, and he was um, telling us about his experience of having her at a convention doing a signing about 10, 15 years ago. And apparently she was baffled by how popular Harley Quinn was. And she greatly appreciated every single person, but she was really confused. She was like, I didn't know people liked her this much. What's going on? You know, I find that with a lot of people that that worked on on BTAS is they, they, you know, gravely underestimate how popular they themselves are. Yeah. Same thing was true with uh, Diane Pershing. It wasn't until she started going to conventions that she realized that Poison Ivy was popular and that people liked her. So she's been going to conventions regularly every year Another since then. Another character that I I love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a shame we've lost such a great soul. Um but you want to know something? We got to we got to watch her make this I mean, she didn't make the character, but we got to see this this character created because of her. Mm-hmm. But we also hear some really great stories uh, from, you know, other people about Arlene. Mm. And you want to know something. It's really great to actually hear stories that are, they're quite, they're funny, but they're not gross. (laughs) (laughs) You know, because sometimes actors, actresses, you know, in in the entertainment industry, you find out things you don't want to find out after Mm -hmm. they pass or after they're not as popular. But a lot of the people that have worked on this show have been quite, not wholesome, I wouldn't say, but, you know, real. Yeah, nice people. Yeah, genuinely nice people. I and just... thank you for that, by the way. Thank you for being good people. If anyone, probably no one, if anyone from the show listens to this, thank you. Because, you know, because of y'all, not only do I have a good husband, <laughs> <laughs> but I've got some really great memories and it, it's helped mold my life into not wanting to be an asshole i know i said i only had one other thing i wanted to mention earlier i just remembered one other thing i would like to say about arlene sorkin Mm -hmm. so this was from her appearance on batman the animated series podcast she talked about her personal life she said she always finds it so frustrating because uh, people assume that she's related to um aaron sorkin yeah it's like no we're not related no and so it got worse when she married christopher lloyd oh yeah not not doc brown christopher lloyd it's the one that i thought fraser the fraser producer and modern family yeah modern family co-creator she said that everyone's always confusing her family and she's getting confused herself now oh i thought that was great arlene sorkin was very witty Uh, i watched a um a tv interview she did decades ago where she went back home you know, to show the TV yeah. where she was from. And she she just came up with this little skit where she went into her parents' house and it was there, there was someone decorating in there. And she went, my parents have moved out and not told me. Oh. <laughs> it's obviously a joke because then the yeah. mum comes around the corner and goes, hey, Arlene. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, bless. I'll have to, is that online anyway? Yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah. I'll, I'll have I'll to send look you the at link. that. Yeah, yeah, send it to me. Maybe I'll link right. it on, on here. So after that... Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to check us out on socials. Yes, I can't remember what they are. (laughs) (laughs) Totally Shway Podcast, at Totally Shway Podcast on Instagram, threads, TikTok. I've started posting stuff on TikTok. A little rant here. I uploaded a clip from Mask of the Phantasm. Oh, here we go. That featured Batman punching someone in the face and TikTok. Uh, masked it saying it was distressing content yeah i'm like listen here mfers i've opened your app up and the first thing i can see no i actually said the full word (laughs) i've loaded up your app here and there's some dangerous challenge of kids hurting each other and that's fine but batman punching somebody in a cartoon is considered distressing and dangerous oh yeah because that bugs me because i saw on my tiktok feed which is is filled with autumn vibes cooking autumn vibe food and autumn vibe fashion you you get where i'm going here it's autumn um it's filled with that and then randomly a person just lighting their hair on fire yeah but that 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 can be allowed right but Mm -hmm. an animated thing like that is yeah anyways i'm scowling all of our socials are in the description hopefully 
<laughs> Hopefully I've remembered this time. <laughs> They're in the description. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them down there. Again, you can always message us on our social media platforms. So you can't hear it right now, but my cat is scratching his food mat telling me that he's hungry. So have a great day. Have uh, a good week. And please, please, please don't forget to buy... Mask of the Fan Phantasm. Don't forget to buy Mask of the Phantasm 4K on Amazon, Apple, your your you know your local video store. <laughs> Go to your blockbusters. <laughs> Hollywood Video, come on, <laughs> traitor! All right, bye guys. Say bye, Luke. Bye, Luke. Okay. <laughs>